All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Newman Centre here at University of Toronto. My name is Peter Copeland, and it's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the St. Monica Institute and Catholic Conscience to collaborate on another uh, Faith and Reason lecture, although tonight is a, a special lecture. It's a Faith and Profession lecture, we're calling it. Um, so I'd love to introduce our two guests who will speak to us tonight about the vocation of nursing and uh, a particular uh, exemplar of that vocation. So Helen McGee is a mental health nursing consultant in independent practice. Um, her clinical work has focused primarily on young people and families at the onset of schizophrenia. Later, she led clinicians as they developed their clinical skills and services. Helen has served as the president of the National Association of Catholic Nurses since 2020, starting the chapter, I do believe. In this role, she's encouraged Canadian nurses to anchor their vocation in prayer and participation in the sacraments, face the clinical challenges of Canada's culture of death. So Helen will speak with us uh, later about the vocation of nursing from the Catholic perspective. And Dr. Gosha Berchinska, she will correct me on the pronunciation. Okay, um, that's good. So far, so good. Is coming to us, to us from across the sea. Um, Gosha is a bilingual humanities graduate who wrote her BA dissertation on leprosy in Siberia, another exotic topic. And she subsequently obtained a degree in nursing from Columbia University in New York City, going on to specialize in pediatric oncology nursing. And since 1985, she's been involved in the education of nurses in the UK, teaching healthcare ethics, ethics philosophy, and nursing humanities. And at the end of her career, she worked as an international officer for the Royal College of Nursing. She's a fellow of the Florence Nightingale Foundation, an honorary member of the Polish Nurses Association, and a member of the Polish Association of Catholic Nurses and Midwives. And she's currently the president of um, CICIAMS. She's also translated into English Father Lucian Krolikowski's autobiography, A Franciscan Odyssey, and Blessed Hannah Hrchanowska's um, definitive biography. So, with great pleasure, I'm here to welcome Gosha. Good evening, and thank you for having me here to give this talk about uh, Blessed Hannah and her nursing wisdom and spirituality. And I feel especially privileged to be here on the eve of her feast tomorrow. And I'd like to dedicate this talk to all nurses, and especially those nurses who work in the community. The talk will be in two parts. The first part about Blessed Hannah's wisdom and the second part more about her spirituality and how they interconnect, if I may. Um, Blessed Hannah <coughs> was a committed professional Catholic nurse. She was also a wise woman. The question I wish to address today is why and in what way is she to be considered wise and what for us is the enduring significance and legacy of her nursing spirituality. Moral philosophy, theology, fine literature, and sacred biblical texts all confirm the observation that it is the wise person who knows where they have come from, who they are, and where they are going. This existential grounding of their personality in true reflective self-knowledge is fundamental to their acquisition of wisdom. But being wise should not be confused, however, with various forms of egocentricity. The ultimate aim of the truly wise person is not so much to understand themselves as to understand what is essential to know, while everything else, all other knowledge and understanding, to be considered as irrelevant trivia. The question of such wisdom, therefore, depends on the discernment of those facts 
which are to be considered essential to true happiness and successful living, and those which constitute fanciful digressions. Knowing, however, which fanciful digressions are in fact at the very heart of the matter constitutes the nature of true wisdom. It is the wise person, if the wise person understands others <clears throat> from the perspective of their own self-knowledge, where knowledge of one's true self induces and promotes a sense of personal humility, this wise person begins to see the true nature of others in that same unfrivolous and often unflattering light, however benevolently. In a talk to her nurses, Blessed Hannah insightfully observed that chronically ill patients are totally dependent on the efforts of people that surround them. Often they cannot properly estimate the strength and endurance of people who are helping them. They keep increasing their demands. They stop understanding other people and that it is often the cause of much conflict in which by no means one can say that the patient is always right, not at all. End of quote. This is a statement made from experience and deep knowledge of human nature. After all, part of the principal commandment which binds all Christians together is to love your neighbour as yourself. For this reason, it is often observed that wise people tend to be benevolent towards others and manifest a sense of humour. In another place, describing care given to one of her patients and trying to understand them better, Hannah asks rhetorically, what are the prayers of this old drinker? What is happening inside her? She is only an old alcoholic whose empty flasks are carefully put out of sight so the nurses won't see them. But is she only a drinker? Who is Mrs. Krasitska, apart from being our patient, and the subject of our concern for so many years? Certainly, a wise person is a person who understands other people, in fact, enjoys other people and their ways. We would say a wise person delights in the humanness of other, of others and smiles fondly on the human absurdities that surround them. As one moral philosopher put it, a wise person grasps not only the nature and structure of affairs in the world, but also the way these, aff these affairs are felt in the subjective lives of those who participate in them. Now, understanding people and how they behave is what many nurses consider as part of their professional role and is definitely something that Blessed Hannah demonstrated countless times. But as the moral philosopher Neville points out, a sage's understanding of the world and people in it is fundamentally different to the understanding shared by the unwise. Sages, that is wise people, base their understanding of others on processed, reflective, experiential exposure to incidents rather than an intuitive conditioning. As he points out, sages must live through events in order to understand their texture. And living through events, as we know, usually takes some time. And if we look at the ancient writings, for example, at Aristotle in the Nicomachean Ethics, he points out the truism noted by many that a young man has no experience, for experience is a product of a long time. In fact, one might also raise the question why it is that a boy may sometimes become a mathematician, but not a philosopher or a natural scientist. The answer may be that the object of mathematics are the result of abstraction whereas the fundamental principles of philosophy and natural science come from experience. That's a full quote from Aristotle. On the whole, therefore, wisdom is seen to be the fruit of a reflective and long life. The pivotal ingredient in the achievement of wisdom is the honest, fruitful reflection upon that life. 
But that reflection itself is dependent on the quality of the dialogue undertaken with the narrative of that life, not necessarily the length of time it takes to do the reflection. One could now start to consider what this understanding of the nature of wise people can tell us about the nature of wise nurses, and Blessed Hannah in particular. How would a wise nurse differ from a foolish one, or any other healthcare professional? What are we in fact identifying in a person such as to consider them to be wise? So how does one encourage the development of wisdom, both as a moral and theological <coughs> virtue, and as a personality trait? It is the most, it, if it is the moral development of individual members of society, which helps foster a societal climate conducive to moral growth and ethical reasoning, then these are serious questions deserving of our consideration. For Albert Schweitzer, the Nobel Prize winner in 1952 for his approach to the reverence of life, the most significant factor in an approach to the cultivation of wisdom was the necessity of laying down adequate foundations. That is, for him, to remind people of their true humanity and humanizing the world in which we live. Schweitzer was convinced that even if all the elements of self-awareness and the need for reflection were in place, without an ethical foundation, society and civilization itself would disintegrate and all our professional efforts at self-improvement with it. Aristotle, in his Nicomachean Ethics, claims that if it is impossible, that it is impossible to be good in the full sense of the word, without practical wisdom. Or to be a man of practical wisdom without moral excellence or virtue. Indeed, Aristotle considered practical wisdom to be the principal virtue that binds together all other virtues, claiming that as soon as a man, and this is a quote, possesses a single virtue of practical wisdom, he will also possess all the rest. But contemporary ethicists point out that for many cultures and religions, there are alternative approaches to becoming wise, and they write about the concept, and here I quote, of heart knowledge. It is this heart knowledge which moderates and educates us. They are convinced that it is not so much the intellect which needs to be primed, as a need to open the eyes of the heart, which has various scriptural overtones. So far, it would be difficult to argue that a contemporary nurse should be anything else but an exemplar of Aristotle's practical wisdom. Wisdom to the Greeks of Aristotle's time consisted of an ability to successfully deliberate about important issues, such as, and this is a quote, what sort of thing contributes to the good life in general. People with practical wisdom, according to Aristotle, had the capacity of seeing what is good for themselves and good for mankind. Qualities which would benefit managers, teachers, leaders, nurses, and many others. If we consider the qualities required of a good practicing nurse, surely this practical wisdom of which Aristotle speaks is one of the essential virtues we would cast aside at our peril. There is an element of caution, however, in Aristotle's consideration of practical wisdom, for he does not see it as a quality that can be entirely learnt or acquired, or that we could train ourselves to gain. He says, it is not merely a rational characteristic or trained ability. An indication is the fact that a train, trained ability of that kind can be forgotten whereas practical wisdom cannot. Wisdom, as perceived by Aristotle, is a supreme virtue because it represents an entire, all-encompassing personal approach and lifestyle. 
To be wise for Aristotle is not just to display and possess certain moral characteristics. It is to be a particular type of person. That is why, apart from an understanding of deontological aspects of healthcare work, i.e. professional codes of conduct, and an appreciation, if not internalization, of scriptural edicts and norms, for example, the Ten Commandments, it is also advisable to cultivate moral and theological virtues, something Blessed Hannah tried to convey in her fascinating paper given to parish nurses and which she distributed, a nurse's examination of conscience. Nurses, as we know, are about caring for their patients, or at least should be. That caring, especially professional caring, is not a virtue in and of itself, can and indeed has been well argued by healthcare ethicists. But it can also be argued that fostering the presence of virtues generally, as widely understood by moral philosophers, should facilitate the flourishing of caring. The human mode of being, as described by the Canadian nurse, Sister Simone Roach. Moreover, two of the most important professional virtues that have been identified and shown to contribute to a moral state of caring within nursing and which have been taken on board by nurse educators, leaders and clinicians are wisdom and compassion. While caring, the result of interaction between wisdom and compassion can be engaged in by anybody, it is a salutary reminder to nurses that caring as such is not and Kevin and can never be their sole prerogative. It is the natural property of wisdom to enable discernment to take place and suggest noble ways uh, of intervention. And it is the natural property of compassion to indicate the means by which to express, uh, uh, by which to express that wisdom in the form of practical caring. Blessed Hannah, <coughs> writing about Florence Nightingale, whom she admired greatly, noted, and this is a quote, she not only ensured that cured patients were correctly discharged so as to facilitate taking in new, pati taking in new patients who required hospitalization, but she concerned herself with the fate of patients once they left the institution. In this, she was a forerunner of medical social workers. This fascinating observation could be said equally forcefully about Hannah herself. This is something she understood. This is something that she would do herself. So she is seeing in Florence Nightingale this wise nurse, this person worth, whose example it is worth to follow. But nurses and pastoral workers ought to be caring. We would even say that they are mandated to care. Yet before this obligated caring can become internalized, this ability to see the need for creative intervention in the welfare of a stranger must first be nurtured and promoted. As Blessed Hannah asked in her nurse's examination of conscience, do I work on developing in myself the qualities of a good nurse? and not become discouraged in this work. All the extant literature on moral and social and spiritual development agree that the normal course of human development is a social process. We learn to be human from other humans, that is, from each other. Indeed, we need the presence of other humans to be capable of true humanness ourselves and to know how to express our humanity. It takes an individual nurse to promote wisdom and compassion among nursing students and junior nurses. And it is only in this social manner that the profession of nursing can share and transmit its acquired wisdom to the next generation. Nursing wisdom is transmitted from one wise nurse to another and needs to be intentionally upheld and professionally promoted if it is to be effectively fostered. Hanna Kshanoska, through her nursing care, eloquently demonstrated the intricate interrelationship between wisdom and compassion and the many ways in which caring can be transmitted. 
Not only did she personally nurse and look after patients, but she worked creatively with hundreds of volunteers and sought unorthodox and novel ways of demonstrating care. For example, setting up retreats for the housebound chronically ill at a time when no one even knew that they existed, since they languished hidden from view in attics and basements and hovels. She was, as had been noted by many of her acquaintances, a natural mentor and leader. But she asked our fellow nurse leaders, do you help other nurses? Do you share with them your experiences? Are you understanding? Anna Kshanoska was undoubtedly a woman who demonstrated in her nursing practice and pastoral approach to community work, moral excellence. Hannah's moral excellence was not, however, artificial or strained. It stemmed naturally from her cultivation of personal and professional virtues, something confirmed by the Holy Church when recognizing that she practiced theological virtues to a heroic degree, a process required before she could be declared a venerable servant of God. Expressions of wisdom and practice of virtues, however, are only possible when humans consciously choose to reflect upon their share of humanity, made all the more wondrous by the mystery of the Incarnation. Wisdom requires of humans that they reflect upon their human nature and encompass with their heart, minds and souls and, and, and soul all that which pertains to their God-given human state of being. Writing about Florence Nightingale, Hannah observed that the famed nursing administrator became, and here, quote, cook, quartermaster, cleaner of toilets, and washerwoman, end of quote. She would go on to use almost the same words to describe herself when asked about her role in the parish nursing movement. <coughs> it is to Hannah's credit that she realized early in her life that caring, especially professional caring, has the mystical quality of humanizing the inhumane and sustaining humanness precisely in those contexts where social norms were most fragile and brittle. Hannah's beautifully described such thoughts in her memoirs when still as a child herself, she helped to clothe and equip another youngster being discharged home from hospital. Sometimes, however, this humanizing activity of sagacity may require of the human person not only moral excellence, but also courage in order to adequately express caring in what Simon Roach called the human mode of being. The horrific social and political events of the 20th century, most of which were witnessed by Hanna Kshanowska, bear testimony to the truism that truly being human takes more than a mere chance of nature. Bruno Bettelheim, the Jewish child psychologist who survived the traumas of a concentration camp, notes that caring spurs on to more caring and is itself inspiring and energizing. As he noted, this helping and being helped raised the spirits. Moreover, courage and heroism were attributed only to those individuals in the camp who disinterestingly cared for others, even at a personal cost, which is something also said about Edith Stein when she was in the transit camp in Holland. In fact, Bettelheim suggests that these courageous carers usually had to lose a sense of personal hope, that is gain or even survival, in order to become liberated, enough to be able to truly care for the stranger in what must be, be seen as one of the most inhospitable and non-caring environments ever devised. This insightful observation is one that finds interesting echoes in spiritual readings and scriptures. Thus, Bettelheim continues, once they abandoned hope for their personal existence, it became easier for them to act heroically and help others. Echoing this observation, Hannah once wrote that we need, and here's a quote, to pull back, to launch oneself onto the wide waters of love and not through gritted teeth and not in a sacrificial mode, 
and not out of obligation, nor treating the ill person as a ladder to heaven. That must be my favourite quote. Not treating the ill person as a ladder to heaven. Perhaps of the patient's surroundings. As noted, bending the environment of the patient's humanising specifications and deliberately breaking various rules and requirements often requires courage. Hannah noted about Florence Nightingale that she, she, that's Florence Nightingale, was perfectly capable of ignoring rules. On one occasion, she even instructed orderlies to break down a door to get at much needed supplies. Hannah, in her memoirs, comments that in nursing, that in nursing school, she thought, many of the, she thought many of the rules were harsh and pointless, but that she obeyed them out of respect for the director of the school, whom she actually liked. Um, and she was only breaking those rules, which in her own words, were considered to be absurd. Interestingly, some people feel threatened by those who are considered to be wise and compassionate. This is certainly the case with Janina Hertz, a young adolescent patient of Hannah's who didn't even really know her. Paradoxically, the truly caring person, that is, the person who has entered into conscious dialogue with wisdom and compassion, is usually far more approachable and more real and authentic towards the proverbial stranger than others may be. The truly caring individual who cultivates the virtue of wisdom is less threatening and less removed from society than those who do not bother to reflect on their mutual humanity. This approachability is the result of them having come to terms with their humanity and enveloping it with a loving compassion. As Hannah noted, first of all, we must be humble. We are not in a position to understand completely the nature of suffering. <coughs> to feel the pain caused by long immobilization. We do not know what really happens in the soul of an ill person. We mustn't lord over them. We must only serve. Otherwise, we would not be following the example of Christ. Wise people are in love with being human. They are passionately concerned about the nature of, humanity, of humanness. A point observed by many writers of hagiographies and biographies of caring individuals and also noted in Blessed Hannah. Blessed Hannah cared for others in the holistic expression of accepted mutual recognition of humanity or, as Beverly Taylor expressed the concept, in mutual ordinariness, a prerequisite for empathy or compassion. Hannah asked, for example, of the nurse what is the attitude towards the family of the patient? She asked, do I try to understand them? Was I, a patient, was I patient with them, even when they seemed boring and intrusive to me? And what if it was my own child who was sick, or my father? This sense of empathy was evident in her personality from very early on in her life. This manifestation of compassion continued into her mature adult life, as noted when she asked her nurses, do I try to make procedures as painless as possible for the patient? Do I expose the sick unnecessarily, not respecting their modesty or that of other adults and children? So now I will go on to the second part, which will be looking a bit more at her spirituality. Unlike for many of our contemporaries, for Hannah to reflect publicly about her spirituality and innermost life, especially to an unknown audience, was not only unthinkable, but more pertinently was perceived by her as a form of unnecessary self-exposure. There is therefore little extant so-called spiritual material amount, uh, among her written legacy. If Blessed Hannah wrote about her spiritual insights and religious convictions, she did so buried in her fiction, and she wrote three books and poetry, and in her many talks when addressing her parish nurses, professional groups, her volunteers, and not to mention her students. Hannah commented to her parish nurses, 
and this is a quote, a person is one psychosomatic unit. After all, we have a very strong confirmation of this in the gospel, a glass of water given in the name of Christ, words full of love. Give her something to eat, another comment. The treatment of infirm bodies, and through that, the healing of ill souls. These are truly gospel activities, which deepen our understanding about the psychosomatic unity of man." End of quote. Hannah saw herself as a dedicated nurse, and any observations she had concerning spirituality and Christian living were therefore always in the context of her professional Catholic nursing practice. She observes, the work we do, the kind of service we deliver, is an apostolate of action, not words. And this helps in preparing the way for the conversion of the patients. How can a suffering man comprehend the depth of Christianity, or even an aspect of Christianity, when he is unwell and neglected, and cannot see any effort made to bring him physical relief? After all, we deal with people who are chronically ill, who often suffer terribly. Hannah deliberately understated her own reflections and thoughts about spirituality because she felt that her personal spirituality was already a lived reality, clear for all to see. In another place she notes, we can only fulfill our apostolic task witnessing with our actions, without many words. And here again, we can observe the influence of our work on the environment of our patients. We know about cases where, thanks to persistent, systematic nursing, not only the hearts of the sick soften, but also those people in their immediate surroundings. And even if their hearts do not soften, can we complain? Surely not. We are simply witnesses to Christ, and that is enough. This very personal, private approach to spiritual insights and developments is, keenly, is deeply reminiscent of the Marian response to divine illumination, where Mary kept all these things in her heart. This is not without significance in Hannah's life, since she also took very much to heart the gospel portrayal of Marian discreetness, privacy, and Mary's urgency in action. She asks of her nurses, do they anticipate the wish of their patients and show them caring concern unrequested? Do I remember that Christ acted immediately among his sick people without delay, going out to meet them, while the mother of God went about her tasks, and there's a quote within a quote, in haste. In fact, that was one of Hannah's favorite quotes, that Mary went and did her tasks in haste. So we should go in haste. Hannah's spiritual experiences are reminiscent of the soul realizing that beyond standing in awe of truths, no measure of description can do them justice, and indeed words would only serve to dilute their understanding. Better just to get on with it, in her case, the nursing work at hand, and leave meditative contemplation to the privacy of one closed room. Such contemplation could then be devoid of words. In 1957, Hannah became a Benedictine oblate, and her spirituality during the last 20 years of her life can be considered a Benedictine nursing spirituality. This period of her life overlaps with her establishing parish nursing in Krakow, where she described the work as caring for the infirm body, and through this nursing intervention, create the possibility for a close relationship between the patient and God. Benedictine spirituality requires reflection and comfortableness with self, as may be the result of a lived conversion of the heart, or as St. Benedict noted in his rule, a conversatio morum. Hannah's wise converted heart was a Benedictine response to what in reflection we can see was a life's task of ora et labora. Esther de Vol, a contemporary Anglican Benedictine oblate interprets this conversatio as meaning to respond totally and integrally to the word of Christ sent to us all, come, follow me. 
Hannah described her parish nursing work as follows. We try to seek inspiration for our work from the pages of the Gospels, where there are so many examples of Christ's relationships with those who are suffering. Hannah Stroke struck her friends and all those who knew her as a person who was at peace with God and the world, who had a faith that became transparent in the hope that it expressed. Hannah hoped that there would be a better future for her patients, her relatives, her friends, actively worked to bring about such change, while all the time accepting the existing status quo. Hannah trusted in God sufficiently that she could hold on to the gospel message of hope without being false to herself and without pointlessly raging against obvious injustices and inequalities. It is only the person with the wise heart who can muster the necessary courage to express such hope where others would only see folly. This evangelical virtue of hope has to be first of all lived and experienced before it can be expressed in a concrete life. Hannah explains that the underlying philosophy of her work from its very inception had a religious character, that is to help those who were suffering to carry their cross and through them to help Christ. Evangelical hope has to be accepted, believed in and rejoiced in, but always within a particular context. As Hannah noticed, do I realize that as a Catholic, my duty is to evangelize, above all, by example, adding interestingly, but do I flaunt my zeal and devotion? It's her appreciation of this balance between witnessing and proselytizing that constitutes her practical nursing wisdom and spirituality. What Thomas Merton, the American Trappist, said of Lady Julian of Norwich, a medieval anchoress as far removed from Blessed Hannah in post-war socialist Poland as one can only imagine, could equally be said of Blessed Hannah, and in many ways reflects the notion that the two women had much in common despite their superficial, historical, social and cultural differences. Merton noted that Lady Julian, for Lady Julian, her heart, for her, the heart of theology, was not resolving the contradiction, but remaining in the midst of it, in peace. Remaining at peace in the is the fruit of any wise heart, this quiet acceptance of the ways of God, while all the time fighting for those entrusted in her care, resulted in Hannah's unique nursing spirituality of a wise heart. Knowing when to speak out and when to keep quiet seemed to be a particular, seems to be a particular characteristic of wise people. But on the whole, <clears throat> when it came to matters of public displays of religiosity, Hannah tended to keep a low profile, although her permission for nursing students at the Kopierzyn Psychiatric Hospital to take part in the National Nurses' Pilgrimage to Częstochowa in 1957 was the final pretext that the authorities used to dismiss her from her position as director of that school of nursing. It is hard to imagine that she had not taken this eventuality into consideration when allowing the students to take part in the pilgrimage. Perhaps her own participation in the pilgrimage swayed her against adopting double standards. It is practice, if practicing religion was something important for her, then why not also for her students? For Hannah to talk about her spirituality and to write about it would have in some ways been a form of acknowledging the separation between what might be considered temporal and what might be referred to as religious spheres of activities. Hannah saw no such artificial divisions between her spiritual and physical worlds as both were integrated into an indivisible and unique whole. As Hannah noted, do I understand that the Lord God does not divide morality into private and work-related spheres and that his commandments are immutable? We are indivisible, complex, sentient beings, present in God and loved by God as his unique creatures. 
in our entire psychosocial, physical, and spiritual makeup. So Blessed Hannah would ask her, her nurses, do they treat the sick simply as numbers, as sickness cases, forgetting about their unique personality of each of them? <clears throat> Hannah was a person who, like Lady Julian of Norwich, was comfortable in herself and saw the world through the gentle and intelligent eyes of a caring nurse. She indeed had, as Merton observed, a wise heart. Both women di displayed utterly human, yet profoundly wise hearts, and thereby fulfilled their vocations to be perfectly themselves, that is, perfectly human, thereby fulfilling their ontological vocation to be human. Meanwhile, an observation from a literary gardener commenting about her work that to be a gardener is not, for me, a hobby, but a description of a holy state of being. It is working shoulder to shoulder with God, could be said likewise, unedited, about Blessed Hannah. Whatever it is that inspires us to see and experience the transcendent will be, by definition, unique to ourselves, <coughs> but it will also form the prop, in the words of Raphael, to assist us in working shoulder to shoulder with God. It is precisely such a definition of personal vocation, working shoulder to shoulder with God, and expressed through our unique spirituality, which would accompany us through our lives. It is certainly a very apt definition of Hanna Shanovska's approach to her nursing spirituality. As a parish nurse, Hannah observed that her nursing an ill person on behalf of the church could not be restricted to purely physical nursing activities. It has to also have some apostolic character. From the very beginning, we have attempted to follow the words of Pope Pius XII from his encyclical about the mystical body of Christ. And this is a quote from that encyclical. Priesthood among those who are sick lies not only in the hands of anointed priests, but among all those who perform acts of charity towards the sick. In effect, for Hannah, nursing was not work as might be understood in the concept of a chore. It was, in Raphael's word, words, a holy state of being. As Hannah observed, we who nurse the sick are in the best positions due to the very nature of our work, this systematic service to the infirm, to clear the way to their souls. She was a woman, as Thomas Merton would say, with a wise heart, because having totally embraced her life's work of nursing, she proceeded to immerse herself in it and enjoy it. She did not see it as a chore. She, was, she saw her work as her answer to carrying the cross of Christ, as Edith Stein noted in 1930, the fruits of such integration cannot be hidden, and the effect will be felt by everyone around such a person. And this is from a quote from Hannah's letter. They will be like a good spirit spreading blessings everywhere. It has been noted during Blessed Hannah's lifetime that she spread blessings all around and encouraged others to do likewise, asking them do I pray for the sick and all those entrusted to my care? Or in another place, one of our sisters prayed all night and implored the mercy of conversion for a very reluctant woman just a day before her death. Hannah fully recognized, as she put it, that the fundamental problem in our apostolate of nursing is the nature and mystery of suffering, adding, in most cases, the answer to the question, why me, or what is this for, is best answered simply by, this is God's mystery, in the same way as God's mystery is the suffering of Christ. So, in conclusion, in an age of quick solutions, easy answers, fast remedies, and all pervasive market econ economics, Everything shouts against the acquisition and development of such caring modes of being, and with it, of wise compassion 
and a nursing spirituality. Since reflective caring in the pastoral nursing context is based upon a delicate balance and interaction between wisdom and compassion, that is, on a creative, deliberate, nurtured, interpersonal and intrapersonal dialogue, obvious doubts are raised as to whether this particular virtue-based Christian scenario is an attractive proposition in today's world, and in fact valued by today's world. It is not only the psychological state of compassionate empathy and scientific and professional knowledge which needs to be instilled and promoted among healthcare practitioners. There is also the all-important Christ-like response to suffering that needs to be considered. But as Hannah reminds us, there are also very many good people, and it is often calamities and sickness that draws forth their goodness and turns it into action, so not all is lost. More significant for the continued humanization of society is the cultivation of and respect for the virtue of wisdom and the practice of faith, if true Christian moral pastoral caring is to be promoted. In the absence of wisdom and prayer, professional caring can become empty and hollow. Hannah Hranoska, the wise nurse, unconsciously summed up her own concept of nursing wisdom when she wrote, let us not just think about fighting evil. We may well, it may well be that evil absorbs us more and not just as a literary subject. We must talk about it, even shout about it. But can't we also shout about goodness? About a goodness which is born out of misery and dreamt up in love day after day. It is obvious that a discouraged, pessimistic profession full of disheartened practitioners can neither provide innovation in the art of nursing nor meaningfully contribute to an improvement in an ethical healthcare state. Such a profession will not have the moral energy or courage to pursue wisdom. It is not always easy to be optimistic about oneself, one's future or one's profession and certainly not sufficiently so uh, to be able to develop uh, professional moral virtue or wisdom. But as Hannah noted, what trials we encounter, fatigue, disgust, and temptation to run away. But if we stand firm in these trials and temptations and move on, even with scars, what a victory. More research therefore needs to be done on the pastoral nature of nursing wisdom. Now that it has been demonstrated there is such a concept as pastoral wisdom, which can be observed in nursing care, it is necessary to look closer at present day nurses and practices to see just how wisdom and compassion can be fostered. A generation ago, Blessed Hannah clearly demonstrated that wisdom was an integral aspect of her professional caring. I am convinced, however, that the contemporary Catholic nurse and healthcare worker can and indeed must foster wisdom through the combined and overlapping aspects of continuous personal development and the cultivation of intellectual abilities, always tempered with humor, gentleness, and faith. This has been demonstrated by many a saint and certainly by Blessed Hannah. Hannah respectively, perceptively asks whether we can ever speak about a hierarchy of services when we are helping an unfortunate person. It is so often forgotten that when Christ gave us his new commandment, the commandment of love, he illustrated it with the example of the Good Samaritan, an interesting comment about a very gritty and feet on the ground parable. It is probably one of the most practical stories in the whole of the New Testament. But it was left to the Trappist contemplative monk, Thomas Merton, to observe that it is the wise heart that lives in Christ. And we can see how in the works of Blessed Hannah, her wise heart certainly lived in Christ. Thank you. Thank Gosha for sharing her talk with me ahead of time. 
And so my talk is structured on comments, my reflections on uh, the content of Gosha's talk, and also on some questions that Peter and Matt Marquardt sent me ahead of time. So what is the importance of Blessed Hannah's example for us in Canada? Well, first of all, she had a strong sense of her identity as a Catholic, probably different at her time in uh, Poland than it is here living as, li as we live in a sexual, secular culture. But she had a, a strong sense of where she came from, who she was, and where she was going. She also talked about knowing and engaging with the person beyond the illness. And uh, in any of our get-togethers as a group of Catholic nurses in our association, we often talk about this. That's what humanizes the care, uh, knowing something about the person before they were so extremely ill uh, in the case of some of the people we take care of. The other thing about her was her sense of innovation. So she was an early pioneer in nursing education in Poland, but her development of community services was also well ahead of her time. <clears throat> she worked both with uh, professional nurses and with volunteers and got everyone organized to provide the care and even had priests coming with her to uh, learn about the care of the sick and to provide pastoral care. Um, <clears throat> Something about her time, the political, cultural, and ethical issues, uh, you know, Blessed Hannah led the development of nursing in Poland through education, edit, editing a professional journal, and the development of parish-based nursing services to chronically ill homebound patients, as Gosha was talking about. She nurtured Catholic nursing students, which made her a target for civic communist authorities, and she was forced into early retirement because of this. Here I see her as a model for Catholic nurses, especially nurses in Ontario, because, um, you know, when we, say, decline to refer somebody for uh, euthanasia, uh, we could be a target of our professional licensing body, the same, maybe even more so, for the physician, Catholic physicians. Despite this, she continued, so she was forced into retirement, but she continued her commitment to caring for the sick and her vocation of caring for the sick by developing this model of community-based care. And I just, I think it's very true for her and for us that this commitment to practicing nursing as a Catholic requires frequent participation in the sacraments and a life of prayer. And I'd just like to comment on her ideas about the integrity Certainly our College of Nurses requires us to act as professionals outside of our work as well as in the workplace. And <clears throat> I think as a Catholic, if we, um, you know, through the Sacrament of Reconciliation and uh, reception of Holy Eucharist, if we learn that some of our behaviors are sinful, um, I guess, you know, this has to apply to both our work setting and our personal life. And, you know, one example might be a learning about natural family planning. Um, that affected my practice because it made it uh, impossible for me to administer oral contraceptives, refer for abortion. Uh, so the integr my integrity was, um, it required uh, similarity between, or really the same practice between my personal life and professional life. Um, I think Peter or Matt asked, what is the mission of the International and National Association of Catholic Nurses Canada? So, CCMS is the International Group of Catholic Nurses. It's a private association of the faithful that collaborates with several Vatican dicasteries. It coordinates the work of the National Catholic Nursing Associations, including NAC in Canada. And uh, collaboration with Gosha is a result of this um, uh, connection between the various national groups around the world uh, because I met her last summer at the International Conference and uh, invited her to come to Toronto. Both organizations give Christian witness by supporting Catholic healthcare workers, developing respect for life from conception to natural death, evangelizing nurses by encouraging prayer and participation in the sacraments, promoting and participating in research and development to achieve optimum care and well-being, and acting as a witness to Christian values in our work 
with other professional associations and in public discourse. Um, it probably, probably you have an idea of what nurses do, but what is nursing all about? What is the vocation of nursing? According to the Nursing Act in 1991, uh, in Ontario, the practice of nursing is the promotion of health and the assessment of and the provision of care for and the treatment of health conditions by supportive, preventive, therapeutic, palliative, and rehabilitative means in order to attain or maintain optimal function. But beyond that definition, the vocation of nursing allows us to participate in God's love and join Jesus' healing ministry through closeness, compassion, and tenderness for those who are ill and vulnerable, respecting the dignity of life from conception to natural death. The question, what, does, uh, what value does nursing add to the healthcare system? I would say it's ongoing assessment of patient needs um, administration of treatments and evaluation of the effect of those treatments and the person's progress. The nurse is really closest to make to, to the patient to make those observations in hospital on a 24-7 basis, but even when I was working as an outpatient nurse, I really had more time to spend with the patient than other people on the team, so I could in, uh, help, to help the patient to express this to the doctor when uh, they met, but also um, keep the team informed about what the issues were. I think I've talked about what does it mean for uh, to be a nurse from a secular versus a Catholic perspective. I've talked about the integrity between personal and professional life. Of course, there are many good nurses whose primary goal is to serve patients to the best of their ability, but Catholic nurses are sustained in their work by integrating Catholic, Catholic moral teaching and uh, sustained by God's grace through participation in sac the sacraments and through prayer. I want to finish up, uh, I think, at this point. Uh, if you have other questions, you could um, ask them and we can have other discussions, but uh, I think that uh, time-wise we should finish up at this point. Thanks, Peter. Okay, great. So, um what you said about wisdom, Gosha, I really found that um, found that profound. I think we 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 recognize that these um, soft skills, I guess you, you call them, in kind of technical speak, are very much lacking today. I think in general, in terms of how we think about education, um, ever since the division of labor and you know focus on um, efficiency and measurement. Um, you know, the way we approach education for vocations, for professions, for universities and colleges, it's very much um, increasingly hyper-specialized, focused about codes of conduct and, you know, abstract principles, as you mentioned. And um, so do you find in, in nursing, is there a greater focus than, say, for physicians on character formation and caring and where do you see the, the trends in that space? Are, we, are, we, are there signs of hope? Do you think we're moving more in that direction? Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a very good question. Um, and I taught healthcare ethics and philosophy to nursing students and healthcare workers generally for 25 years. And I found over the time and, and now uh, this big, uh, I think the biggest problem is not that there is no space in the curriculum or in the, in the education of nurses and healthcare workers and physicians um, for, for, say, moral philosophy or bioethics or whatever. I think it goes a bit back one step to really what Albert Schweitzer was saying, uh, to fundamentals. I mean, I found that it was very difficult to talk about virtue ethics, which is why I was harping about Aristotle, because I was teaching virtue ethics. It's the kind of nurse that we're trying to be, and we're trying our nurses to be a particular kind of person. Um, but the problem is that how do you train, how do you talk about that? How do you get into a debate about that? Uh, if, if some of the students didn't see anything wrong in taking, I don't know, um, bottles of aspirin from the 
cabinet in the, on the ward or taking uh, towels from the, you know, whatever. You know, th th there was a mismatch. There, was, there were some very basic fundamentals about living uh, as a person within society. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have to go back one step. <laughs> you know, I would almost say, let's go back to primary school and to high schools. And, you know, I don't know what they're teaching people, but yeah. they're not really preparing for a generation that can hear about virtue ethics. And that was, that was what I found. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that's reassuring. It's like, yeah, I can see where the problems are, but I'm not a high school teacher. I'm not a grade school teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, but I don't know if you find it any different. You have several children. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's a great point uh, to hear from you, Helen. Next, I, I think I, I agree. People have a sense too that some things arrive, but I would say, you know, we're open grasping at the solution. Um, you know, I, I hope um, there'd be more appetite for for some of this sort of stuff. But it seems like we're not quite yet on the cusp of it. No. Um, but I would say, you know, part of, part of this, philosophically speaking anyway, is, you know, we emphasize um, pluralism and diversity and in the ethical, moral, or evaluative uh, uh, domain, those things are all taken to be subjective. And so they're not the subject of rigorous knowledge and inquiry, and you often find that, you know, well, that's the way you do things, that's so you do things, and so we don't necessarily and, and even to educate on some of these, you know, moral character principles is, uh, is seen as an imposition of one's, you know, one's thoughts. So I'd invite your comment on that, uh, Helen, maybe the first question of that as well. Yes, well, Bosha. I guess I think back to some of the patients whose values diverged from my own. And really my job as the nurse is try to understand the person's perspective uh, I don't need to make judgments about what they're doing. I just need to be concerned about their health and uh, well-being. And um, you know, there were certain situations that I was uncomfortable with, and I maneuvered my practice so that I was not encountering those, um, I guess, challenges anymore. Uh, because I had a lot to offer in other ways. I didn't need to be troubled about my work. <laughs> but when the person is in front of me, I have to take uh, their their understanding of their situation in life and what are their goals and uh, mm -hmm. try to help them the best I can. Great. I think not, not at the moment. Okay, yeah. Anyway, that's, that's wonderful. It's just balanced, right? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll come to audience questions in just one or two more, so good to see we have some. I think it's this balance between, yeah, you're serving the patient and their needs, and you also want to uphold, you know, kind of objective standards and their own integrity. It uh, requires wisdom, as you say. You, know, um, you spoke a lot about care and, um, you know, genuine care, what it requires, compassion, time, sensitivity, investment in people, and a lot militates against our ability to do that uh, in our very, you know, fast-paced, uh, efficiency-focused life. Um, do you find this is... Um, I, I, I kind of sense this, that maybe it's better in nursing than for physicians to be able to offer this kind of, this kind of care, um, but maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong there. And do you think... Um, do you see the ability for people in the healthcare sector to genuinely invest the time in, in care declining? Do you see it opening up in, in other spaces? You know, telemedicine and you know, different models are kind of emerging. So, that question to you both. I think to, to really genuinely care for a patient, you really have to be next to the patient. Touch is very important. We've all, people present in the room have all gone through the pandemic. And one of the big comments that was coming out uh, was the way the frail elderly, chronically ill patients and so on were de dehumanized by our, the healthcare workers, approach to them. Misguided, misintentioned, but at the end of the day, many an older person would prefer to be hugged than not to see anybody for two years straight. And if, you're, if you have 
you know, Alzheimer's or you know, severe dementia, you don't understand why the one person that you had contact with can no longer see you. That you don't understand why they're not there. We, we, we really fundamentally missed the point during the fan pandemic. And it was not just in England, it was all over the world. We, we didn't get it. We were trying to help the elderly, but in the process denied them their basic humanity. It wouldn't have been too much to put that significant other into some kind of protective clothing and have them meet their relatives. You know, maybe in the first few weeks we didn't have the, enough protective clothing, but afterwards we did. We chose not to. Um, and, you know, I don't know what poor <laughs> Blessed Hannah is thinking in heaven, but we are now seriously looking at it, and we have to. God forbid there should ever be another pandemic, but we can't repeat the mistakes of this one. But you, if you care about somebody, you're there right next to them. Thank you. I would say that there is a lot of time pressure on nurses. We were just talking at lunch today about how uh, people may not show up for work, and so the team is short-staffed, and there are many more tasks to get done than uh, people to do them. So there is a lot of pressure in nursing, and uh, you know, at the same time, I would recommend people think about mental health nursing because our sole focus is getting to know the person and understand that their difficulties. We have to be there to listen to them and. Uh, if you want that kind of uh, professional experience, not many people think about working in mental health, but it's a very satisfying uh, focus. More question before I go to the audience. Um, you spoke um, of I'm enumerating the different things that are that are necessary. Obviously, um, you know your technical knowledge of health, and um, you spoke a lot about care and compassion and. Um, and the virtues, um, but two things you mentioned I think people don't, don't focus a lot on were courage and prudence, some of these other things that um, you need to, to persevere rather than just have an intuitive and spontaneous response. Um, so, you know, in nursing and in healthcare, you have to, I, I think uh, compassion fatigue is, is something that we, we know of. Um, so, how do you find with, with some of these, these time pressures um, and, and modern life and um, the demands of the job um, presently, um, how, have you, how have you managed to um, maintain that and how would you encourage other, other nurses to um, kind of persevere through the, through the challenges they face? I would like to say something about prudence and rule breaking. I was really interested to think about Blessed Hannah's uh, creative rule breaking. And I think back to the time in SARS where we had to screen everybody who was coming into hospital and they had to answer these questions, kind of like with uh, COVID, you know, so, uh, symptoms of illness and everything, but, and travel outside of the country. But uh, I had a man who brought his wife to hospital and you could tell that it was a very difficult trip. She was agitated, she was psychotic, there was no way she could answer the questions and he couldn't leave her to focus on it. And I was a screener at the door and I just put her into the emergency room without the screening. <laughs> and I think, uh, yeah, I was breaking the rules, the emergency room nurses were not happy with me, but you know, you have to decide, I guess it's the wisdom of experience or prudence, but I had to have compassion for this poor man. The woman needed care, but he had also struggled to get her to care. So that might be an example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think it's this idea. Uh, there, have been, there has been research written about responsible subversiveness. <laughs> but it, it is sort of knowing when you can break the rules, which is what you're talking about, or need to, in fact. But the question was more, how do you maintain your practice in front of fatigue and burnout and so on. I think it's important to tell the young nurses coming into the profession, they've got to take time out for themselves. I think they don't really quite understand that. Um, and also the, the, the hospitals and the, who are employing the nurses or the healthcare systems employing the nurses um, need to also be a bit more flexible. Nursing isn't what it used to be in the past. It is very, very demanding. 
make a mistake and you're out. You know, they, they, it's, it's very unforgiving in that respect. But I think we need more flexible working or part-time working, especially now when nurses are also married, have children and so on. Um, you know, that has to be recognized. But I think you have to be, you cannot be caring about somebody else unless you're caring for yourself. I mean, that's a, a universal truth. You know, you can't care for somebody else unless you understand what it is yourself to be cared for, but also caring for your, for your person. <laughs>